That's awesome. Okay. In those three months, I had an opportunity to learn about their society, to observe their society, and um, I was also kind of the guinea pig, the fish in the fish in the in the fish bowl as well, because many of them were able to observe me and listen to my chains of thoughts, um, because they at the time were teaching their children that were on board the craft. They've of course grown into adulthood, many of them, um, about our world. Um, now their motherships are extraordinary. They're 800 miles. In the middle, on each floor, are, there are park areas. Now, the physical ship on the outside is 800 miles. Okay, that has to deal with the, the outer shell of the craft um, has to pay attention to physical laws in the dimension that it's in. So when they enter third density, and that craft is here in third density, we would see it as 800 miles. Um, even some of their smaller craft, some of their scout craft on the outside when they would show up to take me on board and many of the other ETs that other contactees have met with, let's just say on an average they're 30 feet in diameter on the outside. But on the inside, they deal with different physical, physical laws. And I don't know how they do that. I simply have not been able to grasp it. But the minute you cross that threshold, you literally are in a different dimension or a different plane. Okay? And as such, your physicality has to go through changes. For me, they have to give me a belt that I have to wear that holds my atoms and molecules and cells together. They hold it together for me. So that literally it forms like a cocoon around me. Now I can still touch everything, they can touch me, but it holds my cells together. So that in fifth density, I'm very comfortable, okay? Physically how it feels, you feel not only lighter, but I felt taller, I had more energy, even though I would have to sleep, because you know, we're on a 24 hour cycle, and their one day is equivalent to almost 31 days of our world. That's their one day. And many of the Andromedans were concerned that I wasn't well because I had to keep taking naps. Okay, well, you know, I can only stay awake for 15 hours at a time. So, you know, there are changes. There were some real subtle changes of things that you'd have to deal with. Um, they would have to get some food from Earth to have for me, including water, because I couldn't eat their fruit because it had too much oxygen in it. Um, and, and, the, and the same for the water, okay? Um, one time they came to pick me up and they had the little green tablets. And this is what they use when they're away from the motherships. This is their, their food source. And it contains all the nutrition of their meals. And I mean, they're no bigger than this. And I asked to try it. There was, um, some telepathic communication between the crew. Some of them didn't think it was a good idea at all, but I was able to persuade Morinay to let me try it, of which he did, but he just broke off a little piece, just a little piece for me. So I took it and I chewed it up, and it tasted like hay or alfalfa here in our world. And I immediately felt full, okay? I felt full. I'm like, wow, oh, this is great. You know, this is great. And no more than just a few more minutes went by, and suddenly I'm getting pretty sick. I'm like, oh my God. Okay, and I had eaten earlier in the day on Earth, and I started to throw up. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to tell you, but I made a mess, okay, of this room we were in. And Mornay was more than gracious. He just took me by the elbow and said, come on, let's go. And somebody else cleaned it up. And then he told me that the reason I got sick is because their food has too much oxygen for our body in it. Okay? Um, 
and that's something as far as our ecosystem that they watch very carefully is the depletion of our oxygen levels in our atmosphere. So um, on the motherships, they have these huge parks. Uh, there's all kinds of animal life and plant life. Because they're fifth dimension or fifth density, they have colors there and, and, and animal life and plant life that I cannot describe for you because we just simply don't have any equal or, or anything that I could um, use as a reference point, okay? Um, but nonetheless, they're incredibly beautiful. And you don't use vehicles inside the park, all right? They have train systems or, or tram systems that don't make a sound. They don't have engines. Um, I'm assuming they use some type of form of magnetics. Um, and what you do is if you need to go from one place to the other in the ship, you can either get in and go up along the, the sides because along the outside of these parks, uh, these park areas, is like this. And if you look at every one of these areas here, and we can use this room as, an, as a perfect example, this would be a series of apartments all the way across. This would be a series of apartments with balconies. And everybody lives next to these parks or on the outskirts of these parks. This is where all the living quarters are. And this is on each floor. I mean, one floor literally, could, you could probably take the entire city of Tokyo and put it inside one of these little parks. That's how big it is. And what's even more amazing is that when you're down on the bottom and you're enjoying the park, you know, you're seeing sunlight, sun day, morning, day, dusk, nighttime, and the whole cycle continues again. All right? And it, you can easily forget that you're not on a planet, that you're on a spaceship moving through space. It's awesome, folks. It is just so awesome. <laughs> You know, I, it's just, you just, you just forget, you know, and it's so easy to forget and because everybody's so busy and everybody is, is helping and everybody's just contributing and there's no judgment and everyone has absolute mutual respect for each other and because you don't have any stress and nobody's judging you or, or anything like that. Um, it's an awesome world. It's an awesome world. And there have been a lot of times, there have been a lot of times I didn't want to come back. And they literally forced me to come back. One time in particular, um, I was forced to come back. I didn't want to come back. Nothing was working here for me. You know, and I'm already in another reality. Um, I was forced to come back. They literally forced me to come back. And as I'm standing on the ground, I'm crying, and I'm looking up, and, and the, the craft is leaving, and, and uh, Phaseus is standing there at the doorway, and he turns and he looks at me, and he telepathically says, Alex, the love that you withhold is the pain that you carry, lifetime after lifetime. <coughs> I apologize again. Okay? I want to share that with you. The love that you withhold is the pain that you carry lifetime after lifetime. Now, that was an enormous revelation for me because I was still dealing with my Catholic upbringing. Okay? There is no heaven and hell. It just simply doesn't exist. It's, it's a myth, a story. And are you judged? From what they say, no. What, you, what happens is you cross over and you are shown places in your life where you chose to withhold love. And those are the choices. Those are the reasons you come back is so that you can make different choices to not withhold love. Because love is what is. There is a God or something. The Andromedans don't know exactly what it is, but there is a force. Okay? They refer to it as isness. It just is. Okay? And it holds all of the dimensions and galaxies and universes together. 
It's intelligent. Um, when we got to, to the discussions of God, I always used the masculine um, because of my upbringing. Um, at one point, Phaseus corrected me and said, well, if you had to give it a gender, it would actually be feminine. Okay? So hold, grasp that. Okay. Again, it's a shift in what we've been taught. Um, let's see. It's our destiny to travel out into space. It's our destiny to converse, to establish and create trade with other ET races. Um, I just don't have an exact year of when that's all going to happen. Okay? But it, it's our destiny. And part of that destiny is being able to manage and control and live with ourselves. Um, we all have a soul. Okay? So we are spiritual beings. There is a creator. Create tis okay um, what I want to do at this moment is I once asked I once asked Phaseus what was going to become of us and what was going to happen to our races who are we going to become um, because they were giving me this terrible or not, not terrible, let me take that back. They were giving me this reflection of who we are. They don't understand how we could be genetic royalty and allow people to starve. They don't understand why we would war with each other and build technology for the sole purpose of destruction, thinking that it was, all, that it was going to keep us safe and from harm. When we don't build anything that we don't use. Um... They don't understand they just don't understand why we don't get it. Um, I guess they feel that we should know better. There was a time um, there has been times where there have been many discussions amongst ET groups about what to do on earth to help us. There's been discussions regarding intervention around 2012. There have been discussions about intervention previous to 2012 um, regarding things that most of us don't know anything about in our world. 